Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I'm going to call your attention to two verses there, Ecclesiastes 12, and the last two verses, verses 13 and 14. I'll give you a moment to find it. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. It says in those two verses, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into uh, judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In the New Testament, we're taught by the Apostle Paul that a man's standing before God and his hope of eternal life have, have nothing to do with how good he is or how much good he's done. They have everything to do with his relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, has he trusted in him alone uh, and Christ's perfect sacrifice as his substitute for the sake of his sins? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. That's sometimes referred to as the gospel in a nutshell. That's false. There's not a single mention of the death, burial, or resurrection of Jesus Christ in John 3, 16. And that's the gospel according to the Apostle Paul. The Bible goes on and says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 17. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For he, that's God, hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's Christ that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. If you're in Jesus Christ, you have the righteousness of God now applied to you, covering you, and God sees you now covered in the perfect righteousness of Christ. He no longer sees you covered and clothed with the wickedness and the, and the defilement and the stain of your own sin. Thank the Lord for that. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is of, excuse me, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Philippians 3, verse 9. A Christian can settle the issue of his final judgment and where he's going to spend eternity right here, right now. And you do it right now. By trusting in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, on his behalf, for his sake. My text today, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know, we live in a world in which people are afraid of all kinds of things, things they don't even need to be afraid of. Some things that are statistically not worth worrying about, and yet people do. And so my title today, and I'm going to go back about two years for this sermon, but that's about a hundred sermons ago, so maybe you've forgotten since the last time. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Dictionary.com defines the word fear. As a distressing emotional emotion aroused by an impending danger, evil, or pain, whether the threat is real or imagined. That's how one dictionary has defined the word fear. People are afraid of school shootings and violence. People are afraid of global warming. People get themselves worked up and afraid over nuclear weapon proliferation, nuclear arms. Childhood hunger everywhere they turn, because every image on television seems to depict it, etc. Even though the chances of those things affecting them are very, very slim. 
Global warming is a joke. Don't ever buy into it. Um, you won't be able to control the temperature of the Earth until you can control the temperature of the sun. They're connected. Nobody can control that. I have a friend that I work with. He's all obsessed with styrofoam cups. Dixie cups, you know, our little drinking cups. How many have ever tossed a styrofoam cup into the campfire at the beach or something? Watch it just disintegrate in front of you. Just turns into a gas and goes into the atmosphere. But he's worried that's, that's going to spell our doom if we don't get a handle on that. You've got to be out of your mind. So I threw some extra cups in the fire for his sake. Right? <laughs> there are fewer nuclear weapons in the world now than there were 30 years ago during the proliferation of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. And the world food supply is greater now than it's ever been in the history of man. Even though we have more people in the world, about seven and a half billion, than we've ever had at one time in planet Earth before. Because of modern food production um, abilities and technology, there's more food available. You know something, uh, I'll grant you, some governments are manipulating it and they want to control their people by starving uh, their populations. Uh, that does become a political issue. However, statistically speaking, uh, the problem is not, at least not here in the North America, in the United States, the problem is not uh, childhood uh, hunger, it's childhood obesity. <laughs> childhood obesity. You've seen how fat some of these kids are? Third graders, fourth graders. All they do is sit around uh, their uh, Xbox and, you know, so forth, and they never get outside to get some exercise. They're pudgy and they're overweight at, at, in third grade. It's disgusting. But the one person that, that people ought to fear is the one person they don't fear, and that's God. People are afraid of all kinds of things, even things that never really will threaten them, but they're not afraid of God. The Apostle Paul says there is no fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3, verse 18. We live in a crooked and a perverse generation. Amen. And uh, men simply don't fear God as they ought to fear him. Let me jump into my outline today. Point number one, let me say this. The fear of God is defined. The fear of God is defined. The Bible tells us that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived in his day. 1 Kings 4 verses 30 and 31 say, And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country um, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the nations round about. So when the wisest man who ever lived says something, you and I ought to take Take it seriously. We ought to pay attention to what he has to say. There's a problem with modern man, modern Christianity. They want to redefine the word fear so that it doesn't mean fear in the normal sense, as everyone's always understood it. Now it means to have an awesome respect. I mean, to reverence God like you've, you can't believe. He, God is so awesome. And have I mentioned awesome? That's the vocabulary of modern Christianity. It no longer means to dread the thought of God showing his displeasure and his judgment on sin any longer. And the disobedient. You know, a good, healthy fear will keep you alive on the interstate. It'll keep you alive on the freeway. Nobody gets uh, in a busy intersection and says, this is awesome. Well, there are they're scared out of their mind. They don't want to get in an accident. You know what you're capable of, but you don't know what the next guy is capable of. You might have a license, and you're trying to justify that license by driving safe, but the next guy might not be. So a good, healthy fear will, will do you a world of good. It'll make sure you don't go too fast. Make sure you don't get a ticket. Make sure you stay in your lane as you ought to. Don't be 
reckless and so forth. But uh, that fear is your motivation to watch what you're doing and to behave yourself. The modern version of fear seems to make people out to uh, make, make treat people treat God like he's somehow their good buddy. They slap him on the back and say, let's hang out, dude. Contemporary Christians uh, would deny that, of course. They would say, we don't think of God that way. But the truth is they do. The truth is they do. You watch them all the time. If your fear of God doesn't manifest itself in some right conduct, right behavior, with God's judgment or God's disapproval in mind, then you really don't have the fear of God that you ought to have. In Job 42, verses 1 through 6, we read, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uh, uttered, excuse me, my handwriting is not too clear. Therefore have I uttered that uh, I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. That Job imagines himself uh, talking to God like this. He says, here I beseech thee, and I will uh, speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Then he, can, then he catches himself. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He says, I was presumptuous to talk to you that way, Father, to talk to you that way, dear Lord, to think I could get away with talking to God like that. The prophet Isaiah writes the similar things. He says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am uh, undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Just like people that are just like me. For mine eyes have seen the King of glory of hosts, the King of hosts. Isaiah 6, verses, verse 5. In the New Testament, we read when uh, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, at Jesus' knees, excuse me saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of fishes which they had taken. Luke 5, verses 8 and 9. The miracles and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ caused men to be astonished with fear at the power of Jesus Christ. To fear God certainly does mean to be uh, humbled, and overwhelmed at the very presence of God. Isaiah 64, verse 2 states, As when the <clears throat> uh, melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the water to boil, to make thy name known to thy adversaries, that thy nations, I shouldn't have written this more clearly, I'm sure, that the, <laughs> that the nations may tremble uh, at thy presence. And God asks, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bounds of the sea by the people, excuse me, by the perpetual decree, Jeremiah 5, 22. But to fear God uh, doesn't simply mean only that he's awesome doesn't mean only that God has power to do things and create things right. that no one else could create. Also includes something else. Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Isaiah 66, 5. For all those things have mine eye made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah 66, verse 2. So the fear of God is defined for us in two primary ways. The overcome uh, and reduced at the very thought of God alongside you. When you consider how powerful God is alongside you, you're pretty insignificant. You really are. 
but also to regard some thing that he's spoken, um, some thing he's communicated with the world, you have access to it. The idea that you and I have access to the words of a living God in a book should be a very humbling thing indeed. It should, be, it should strike awe in the heart of every true believer to think that the, the creator of the universe has communicated to us and done so in a book, in a form, that we can actually hold in our hands. And then men treat it lightly and say, well, I'm going to disregard it. It doesn't matter too much to me. His very being and his words, those two things should be the definition of fear for us in the word of God. Jesus told the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in, in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24. We're told what will happen to those one day who have no interest in the truth of God. In his being, his very being. Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Then shall they shall see me, uh, seek me early, but shall not find me. Therefore shall they eat the eat of my fruit, of their do excuse me of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. Proverbs one, twenty four to thirty one. Select verses through there. And we're told about those who have no fear of his words. If any man shall add unto those things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from those words uh, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. The idea that men don't tremble and fear the words of God. And yet they go through life and profess to be believers. They profess to be Christians. Like I said a little while ago, there's a sharp distinction between being saved and being a Christian. Are you a Bible believer? Or do you just hold up the Bible and long enough for people to see it and make you make them think? You truly believe it when you don't read it, you don't memorize it, you don't know much about it, you're not acquainted with it, and really you could care less what it says. But to fear God, and not just to say, he's awesome. You tremble at his words. You tremble at the fact that God exists. One of these days, he's going to be able to judge you, and uh, if God were to get mad at you, you'd sure be in a mess. If God were to judge you, there's no way you could stand. Secondly, not only is the fear of God defined, but the fear of the Lord is also described. That is, it's, it's demonstrated for us in the scriptures. It causes change in you. At least it's supposed to. Solomon says in our text, uh, it's manifested and that he keeps his commandments. Since our salvation is not based upon the keeping of, our, of, of commandments, but by receiving it by the grace of God, uh, then for our sake, the fear of the Lord uh, is shown by how we live, how we obey him along those lines. You'll live no better than the level at which you regard his words. You'll live, live no better. Someone that doesn't regard the words of God, regard the Holy Bible to be uh, important enough is not going to uh, prosper with Jesus Christ. If you see him as being high and holy and lifted up, if you see him as God, the uh, uh, God of judgment, if you see him as one who hates sin, hates iniquity, hates wickedness, then you'll live as though those things mean something to you. But too many Christians don't live as though those things mean something to them because they enjoy their sin. They enjoy their sin. And that's a, it's a constant, it's an eternal problem 
with the flesh. You enjoy your sin and you think you can get away with it. There won't be any consequence. It won't have any uh, repercussion and uh, no one knows about it and no one will find out about it. There won't be any harm done. And uh, for a while there may not be any harm done. That's when you better repent. That's when you better get right with God and make sure no harm comes afterwards. Notice these passages. Proverbs 14, verse 2. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but he that is perverse in his way despiseth him. Proverbs 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Proverbs 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snare of death. Proverbs 16, verse 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, uh, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Deuteronomy 6, verse 2. That thou mightest be, excuse me, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, all that thy days may be prolonged, that thy days may be prolonged. The Lord Jesus put it this way. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. We prove our fear of the Lord by ordering our lives, by ordering our conduct, by ordering our speech, our gestures, our thoughts, our hobbies, our habits, our interests um, in, in the manner that shows our love for him above all things, above all else. If your life as a Christian isn't mindful of those things, then I'm not interested in reflecting. So I want certain things for myself. I'll give everything else to Jesus Christ, but this part I want to enjoy. I want to control uh, on my own. God won't be honored in that. God won't be on. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, the Bible says. Does that describe anybody here? Does your life tell everyone, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, or I'm a hypocrite, pretending to love the Lord Jesus Christ when I really don't? It should. You should be given over to him. My life should be given over to him. So we see the fear of the Lord defined, and we see the, Lord of, the fear of the Lord described. Lastly, let me get to the last point today. It's a very short outline. The fear of the Lord is demanded. It's demanded. After King Solomon finished his remarks by saying that fearing the Lord and keeping his commandments uh, is the whole duty of man, the whole duty of man is not to receive the seven sacraments or the 32 degrees. The whole duty of man is not to break free from the cycle of death and birth and rebirth and rebirth and the cycle of reincarnation. The whole duty of man uh, is not to accumulate goods and wealth and be as successful in this life as you possibly can be so that everyone takes notice of you. The whole duty of man uh, is not to learn that your Heavenly Father has a wonderful plan for you and his celestial wives gave birth to you and your job is to return to his uh, world one day on the planet Kolob and father, father multiple wives of your own someday. But the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't say you ought to be born again. He said you must be born again. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other, none other name given among men, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. Have you been born again? I'm glad I was born again November 5th, 1967. That's the first commandment a man or a woman needs to keep. Once you've done that, then uh, you should start to learn how to fear God in such a way that brings honor uh, and glory to him with everything you do, everything you possess, Everything God's blessed you with should be given back to him and 
used in his service in some way, if at all possible, by his grace and his help. You know, a child should fear uh, failing his father or mother. A child should fear getting a good spanking from their father. It'll teach you some great lessons, too, by the way. Uh, when we were kids, my dad loved us. But he'd take his belt off to us and let us have it, if necessary. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did. Not as much as my brother deserved, but he... <laughs> Bible says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Hebrews 12, verse 6. If your heavenly Father has to step in and punish you, that means you've done something wrong. That means you've deserved it in some way. If he punishes you, it's uh, not because he's trying to hurt you or damage you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to straighten out some bad behavior on your part to make you more uh, fruitful, to make you more productive as a Christian, to make you honor the name of Jesus Christ more than you were previously. He wants you to mind him and to do what he tells you to do. You know, a kid can't tell his dad, you know, I love you, dad, and then not do the chore that dad gave him to do. But if you love him, you do what your dad tells you to do, or do what your mom tells you to do. Paul learned to fear God this way. He wrote, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Proverbs 19, verse 23, tells us the fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. As you mind yourself, you behave yourself, you stay out of trouble, you won't have to worry about God disciplining you. You won't have to worry about hardships coming because, as a consequence of your sin. That's the last thing you'll have to worry about. God may send challenge. God send, may, may send a rebuke because he wants to purge you and make you even more pure than you are now. But don't suffer as an evildoer. Don't do those things which you know you ought not to do. And then wonder, why is everything bad happening to me? Because you've been disobedient to start with. But he should fear disappointing God. I don't want to disappoint the Lord. You know, I know this may sound corny, but I don't want to disappoint my dad and my mom. I'm 58 years old. But the fear of me disappointing my parents still follows me everywhere I go. I've, my dad has always been strong and robust. And if he took a mind to it, he could turn me upside down, plant a foot in each armpit, and use me as a pogo stick if he thought to. And I'd probably deserve it. I don't want to disappoint my parents that way. I don't want to disappoint my Heavenly Father that way. And he should fear failing God. Why is it that people are not afraid of failing God and disappointing God? Someone say, well, I'm sorry I disappointed you. Who cares about you disappointing me? Why are you disappointing God? You say you're a Christian. The last person you even think about disappointing is the Lord. He should be the first one because you've disappointed him more than anyone else. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. The idea that you say you're saved, you say you're a Bible believer, you say you're born again, and yet you want to disappoint God right and left because the flesh wants it. It feels so good to sin. You should fear waking up uh, the judgment seat of Christ and no rewards to show. None of this is mean to intimidate or scare anybody, but uh, let me bring this to a close right here. Even a true believer should be afraid. He should be very afraid. I don't want to fail the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to realize one day that I've been an embarrassment. I've been making too many mistakes. I haven't done anything right for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as a Christian, 
even one who's been saved by the grace of God, you should still be afraid. Be very afraid. Because if the Lord takes a, uh, decides to judge you, the way you've been living as a Christian and his name, you realize in the, in the New Testament, in the 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 5, the Apostle Paul says to turn over one guy to Satan that the flesh might be destroyed and the, the spirit might be saved. And the day, some guy has been out fornicating with his mother, his stepmother, and uh, Paul says to turn such an one over to Satan. Let God kill him, that the spirit might be saved. Keep him from doing any further damage to the name of Christ, to the body of brethren. Now, fortunately, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I think it is, the guy did get right. And Paul says to welcome him back into the fellowship once again. So restoration is still possible. But, you know, it doesn't get much worse than that. And that guy didn't lose his salvation. But Paul said, pray that God kills the guy. A lot of Christians in this world who God needs to kill to keep them from doing any further damage to the name of Christ and to the body of Jesus Christ. You say, that's a harsh thing to say. How can you talk about, well, how can you let people go on day in, day out, month after month, year after year, committing sin, committing fornication, who say that they're saved and they're not living like uh, a saved, or they're living like the devil? You think they're rendering a good work? You think they're representing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ well? No. God needs to wipe them out and get them out of the way. And make, make room for some Christians who do want to live for Jesus Christ, who want to be drawn close to Christ. And by the way, if one Christian gets judged and punished severely for their wickedness, it's going to do a whole lot to keep the next Christian from doing the same thing. All right, this brings us to a close. But I say you should be afraid. You should be very afraid.